Hi everybody, I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is Chris Eliza, political commentator and senior advisor with DGA Group. Chris, thank you so much for joining me. Thrilled to be on, thanks for having me. News is changing by the moment. So as of now, as we sit here, Reuters just reported that the shortlist for Vice President Kamala Harris's vice president is down to Governor Josh Shapiro of Pennsylvania and Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz. Before we get into the pros and the cons of that list, I want to talk about who's not on it, and that's Arizona Senator Mark Kelly. Why yeah. do you think why do you think he didn't make the cut here? Short lists keep getting shorter, right? We went from three to two. Um, I think that Mark Kelly, look, on paper, he seems to me to be one of the stronger uh, nominees. He's a uh, former military. He uh, was a NASA astronaut. He's married to Gabby Giffords, former Arizona congresswoman who became one of the faces of gun control in this country after she was almost killed on, in a uh, incident uh, during her campaign. Um, he's from Arizona, which we know is the swing state. The issue for me is that, you know, campaigns are not fought on paper, and Mark Kelly is not super charismatic. I don't think picking Mark Kelly gets anyone to feel any particular way, good or bad. I guess you could argue that the fact that he doesn't move the needle all that much either way isn't the worst thing, but I just don't think it's someone who it's going to inject more energy into the campaign. That's sort of my guess of why uh, he wound up not making it. The, the other thing, too, is I think Arizona is going to be a little bit of a stretch for the Harris campaign. They could win, but I think it's going to be a stretch, and they probably getting rid of Kelly is probably an acknowledgement of that. So let's just talk about numbers here for a second, because mm -hmm. Kelly's from Arizona. That has 11 electoral votes. Shapiro's from Pennsylvania. That has 19 electoral votes. And Walsh is from Minnesota. That's 10. So who do you think, or which state rather, matters the most in this election? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I was terrible at math, but I definitely can tell you that 19 is more than 11 <laughs> or 10. I, I feel very safe in acknowledging that. So you always want to go to states that count more, right? It's a, 19 electoral votes is still a very big haul of electoral votes. Uh, and that's why I tend to think Josh Shapiro is the pick. You know, I think we could argue that there are there are paths to 270 electoral votes for Kamala Harris that don't include her winning Pennsylvania. But man, there aren't that many. And I think outside of her inner circle, I'm not sure you could convince anyone that they are plausible that she could make. Winning Pennsylvania, to me, seems like a, a thing that has to happen for her to have a chance to win. It's not a guarantee that she'll win, but I think it's the most important state in the country for her bar none. Every strategist, pollster, commentator that I've talked to have said, historically, VP picks don't matter. They can only mm -hmm. hurt, not really help. A, is it different this time because of the historic nature of this election? And B, what is the number one goal of Harris's VP pick? So let me do, let me answer your question, the second question first. I think the number one goal of any VP, VP pick is do no harm, right? You don't, you don't want to make things worse when you're adding someone. Plus, it's her only big decision that she gets to make as a candidate for president, right? This is, she can talk about all the policies she believes in, she can talk about the things she's done as VP, but as the presidential nominee, you really only get to make one big choice, and it's this. So you want, ultimately, it to not be a problem. Um, do I think the VP pick could matter? I would say it matters both good and bad at the margins. Um, I think the truth of the matter is most people vote for the top of the ticket. I always say if you're a big time recruit, for example, in college basketball, if you go to the program and you really like the assistant coach, but you hate the head coach, you're probably not going to go there, right? And so the, it can be additive if you like the assistant and you like the head coach, Maybe that makes you a little bit more likely to go to that school. That's how I think of VP picks. They're the assistant coach. You're probably not making your final decision based on that, but could it matter at the margin? I do think it could, particularly when we're talking about a race in Pennsylvania. That's, you know, it's a one point race. It's a two point race, depending on what polls you see, but it's going to be very close. I don't think that if uh, Kamala Harris picks Josh Shapiro, all of a sudden she wins Pennsylvania 60 to 40, right? That's not going to happen. Um, but if it's a 50-48 race, could he make a point difference? Sure, he's a popular 
uh, governor of the state. He was the attorney general prior. He's been elected three times successfully in Pennsylvania. He's at 58, 59, 60% job approval, including four in 10 Republicans, at least back in May, who say they approve of the job he's doing. So yeah, I think it could make a difference at the margin. That's the key. You just rallied through a bunch of pros for assistant coach Josh Shapiro. (laughs) But are there any cons when you're looking at him when he could be the vice president? Any way he could potentially drag down that ticket if he's announced as the vice president tomorrow? Sure. Um, You know, look, uh, all of these people are human beings, which means they have their pluses and their minuses. There's no perfect candidate out there. If there was, that person would have already been picked. Um, I think for Shapiro, you know, the, the risk, I suppose, for Shapiro is he is Jewish. Uh, there are some people uh, within the party and within the country who are concerned about putting a black woman and a Jewish man on the ticket. That is that asking too much of the tolerance of American voters. You know, very hard for me to make a determination on that. The other thing is Shapiro has been very pro-Israel um, in the conflict between Israel and Hamas, um, more so than I think some on the very progressive left would like. So is there a possibility that some liberals walk away? I, mean, I guess there's a possibility. But to me, it's like the vote is really between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. And the idea that young voters are going to say, you know what, because she picked Josh Shapiro, I'm not. I'm going to go vote for Donald Trump. Is there someone in the country where that's true of? Sure. Is it a large enough number of people for it to make a big difference? I, I don't think so. So let's talk about Governor Tim Walz, who wasn't even a part of the original conversation when it was coming down to VP picks, which seems like months ago, but really it was only two weeks ago when Biden dropped out. (laughs) He then made that viral comment about calling Republicans weird. And it seems like the Harris campaign really held on to that. And that is their strategy going forward. Just calling J.D. Vance weird, different Republicans weird. Mm -hmm. Now he is in the top two. So what are some pluses and minuses for him? Sure. Uh, He's from Minnesota, the Midwest. Uh, The election will come down to Pennsylvania, Wisconsin and Michigan, period. You know, if that's what happened in 2020, I think that's what will happen again in 2024. So if you have someone who can speak that language, right, who is seen as a credible voice, who can campaign actively in Michigan and Wisconsin in particular, um, I think that's an argument for him. The other thing, too, is he has a pretty impressive resume. Again, like Mark Kelly, served in the military, small town, rural uh, upbringing, was a football coach, won a Republican House district when he was in the U.S. House, has been elected and reelected as governor of Minnesota. So there's a lot there, but I actually think you hit on it. Like, if you think about it, weirdly, Democrats have struggled to find a message that really kind of resonates as it relates to Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, particularly Trump. They've tried a million different things um, and it hasn't really worked. But the weird thing did work, at least for a week. Um, and so I think they're they're thinking the Harris people thinking is, you know, is this guy a messenger who can kind of break through and solve the riddle that Hillary Clinton couldn't, that no one in the Republican primary could either in 2016 or 2024, uh, which is how do you beat Donald Trump from a message perspective and maybe Walls has sort of, you know, unlocked that lock. That's a really interesting point because if someone were to be insulted, I think they would rather be called weird than a threat to democracy. I mean, a threat to democracy does carry a lot of weight, yep. except in this instance, weird seems to be doing the trick. Why do you think that is? So, I mean, I've spent more time than I'd like to admit publicly thinking about just this is, you know, why do these things like uh, Donald Trump calling the 2020 election fraudulent when there's no evidence that it was the January 6th riot at the U.S. Capitol, all of it. Why are those things not things that motivate voters against him? And I think the answer is that it's sort of baked in at this point that voters, whether it's the, you know, the 34 felony uh, convictions, whether it's the, the the bankruptcies, whether it's the stuff he said about elections and election fraud, they sort of like, well, that's Trump. You know, it's just kind of like, well, we kind of already knew that about it. And it's hard to break through that sort of feedback loop. The weird thing, again, weirdly to me, seemed to do that. Now, it worked for a week. 
Well, you know, who knows? Uh, you know, and, and it worked largely against J.D. Vance, a little less so against Donald Trump. But, you know, I do think you never know what resonates with people. What I can tell you, I mean, I, I wrote and talked about this regularly when Joe Biden was still a candidate. Joe Biden wanted to make the election about capital D democracy. Democracy is on the ballot. Um, you know, whether it's the 2020 election, January 6th, uh, other things Donald Trump has said about being a dictator uh, just for one day and all the, that this is really what the election is about. Voters weren't responding. The Democratic base liked that message, but they were already going to be for whoever the Democratic nominee is. The issue is swing voters. And I don't think swing voters were particularly motivated by that. Nancy Pelosi, the former speaker, reportedly threw her support behind walls. As we know, according to reports, she was the one leading the charge in getting President Biden to drop out of this election. So mm -hmm. how much do you think her opinion really matters here? Oh, I think it matters. Um, I, I think in my view, just a personal view, is that she is the single most effective political strategist and politician in the Democratic Party, with the exception of Barack Obama in the last 30 or 40 years. I mean, just look at what she's done. You, you can like her or not like her, but just look at what she's accomplished. Um, so I think it matters. Do, do I think that uh, Kamala Harris uh, decides who she wants based on who Nancy Pelosi says? Probably not. But I do think you have to listen to Nancy Pelosi's sort of political ear, because I think that ear has been proven over the years to be very, very effective. But with politicians, particularly when you're talking about a, a running mate, it's a very personal decision. I think we tend to analyze it based on, you know, do they agree on policy? Uh, will they help in a swing state? And I think it like that too. I, I think politicians think like that to an extent. I also think it's kind of a personal decision. Can I campaign with this person for the next four months? If we win, can I deal with this person for the next four years, sort of, you know, being my second in command, but probably wanting to take my job at some point? So it's a very, you know, it's it's politics is more relationship driven than I think we sort of give credit for. It's not just this dry numbers driven conversation. A lot of it's about do I like this person? Do I think this person will support me in what I want to do? Do I think this person will help me win? Within the past two weeks, Vice President Kamala Harris has seen historic fundraising numbers. Her campaign has been called Brat. She's got that Gen Z embrace on social media. There's been a lot of talk about her VP pick. Once this mm -hmm. is once the pick is picked, do you think that this honeymoon phase is going to end and then there's going to be more serious conversations solely on the policy, what the what an administration with Harris at the top of the ticket is going to look like? Mm -hmm. Good question, because the other thing I think you have to factor into that is the Democratic Convention starts August 19th. So, you know, really, we're two weeks from today. So realistically, we're kind of looking at a two week window. Um, Harris and whoever this VP pick uh, will be uh, will campaign across the country over this coming week. That will get a significant amount of positive attention unless they do something dumb. I mean, it should be a pretty easy rollout in swing states. Um, and then you're a week away from the Democratic National Convention, which, you know, just like the Republican Convention was last month, is, is basically sort of a four day long message opportunity for Democrats. Right. Um, that said, look, I covered the 2020 presidential race, uh, the primary. She was not a great candidate. Um, she took a number of positions in that race on fracking, on Medicare for all, on mandatory buyback of assault weapons, on other things that she has since reversed. But she was trying to position herself to the left uh, in that primary. Um, there, to my mind, there is some there there as it relates to excavating her record and saying, well, you said this in 2020, but now you say that. Um, do we get to that between now and the Democratic Convention? I guess I'm a little skeptical that we do, given the truncated timeline that actually works in Harris's favor. Um, do we get to that point before the election? Yeah, I think we do. I, I, I think before November, before voters vote, um, you'll see a, a deeper dive into her record, her position, some of her flip flops on the issues. You bring up a really interesting point because if we all remember back to 2020, I mean, she was a candidate running for president who didn't even make it to the year 2020. She dropped out in 2019. Yep. So do you think that she is a better candidate now in 2024 than she was in 2020 or simply Democrats ran out of time and this is their best option? 
<laughs> a little from column A and a little from column B. Um, I think more from column B. Look, the, the truth of the matter is, you know, Joe Biden gets out of the race at, at July 21st. It's the convention is less than a month away. You have a sitting vice president who is a black and South Asian woman. It's very hard for her not to be the de facto nominee. She, she could have not, but very hard for her not to be. So I think it was kind of like we're in we're in a bad place. We've got this person here. We're going to move this person in. So part of it's that. The, to answer the first part of your question, man, Democrats sure hope that she's a better candidate than she was in 2020. You know, early indications are positive. The only thing I would say is, like, it's not that hard to be a good candidate if what you're doing as a candidate is going to packed uh, campaign rallies where everyone loves you. You know what I mean? Like, you know. Once you get over to the, the public speaking piece, right? I mean, if, if, if I had went to something later this afternoon or tomorrow or whatever, where there were 100 people all chanting my name and holding signs like Chris is the best, it's a pretty comfortable environment, right? I'm not sure you could judge how good a public speaker I am or how good I am on, uh, on streaming or TV or whatever based on that. So she has not done any major sit down interviews. She has not taken any questions from the mainstream media. So like, she's really not faced any sort of adversity in these two weeks as a candidate, which I totally understand from their strategic standpoint. They wanna make sure she gets off the ground in the best way possible. But that will come. And I think that's when we figure out if she's a good candidate or, or an improved candidate or not, right? It's not really about like, I always tell my kids, like anyone can be a good leader when your team is winning 19 to two. It's harder to be a good leader when your team is losing 19 to two. And, you know, so adversity, I think, will, and that will come because that's the nature of a campaign. I think adversity will sort of teach us more than, about her candidate quality, whether she's better, or worse, or the same than these two weeks have. And J.D. Vance has faced some tough questions about past comments he's made about women in particular. Do you think that her yep. VP pick is going to have the same media experience as him, or they've learned lessons from the Republicans' somewhat sloppy rollout of their vice presidential nominee. Yeah, I mean, Democrats certainly hope that this person doesn't have the same rollout as J.D. Vance. I mean, Rocky would be a kind way to describe that. The thing I didn't understand with Vance and why I always thought that Doug Burgum, the governor of North Dakota, was a better pick for Trump is that, you know, look, Vance got elected to the Senate in 2022, but he was a public figure for a very long time before that, well, largely due to his memoir, Hillbilly Elegy. So he had given zillions of interviews and gone on podcasts. As someone who talks a lot for a living, you too, there's a lot of stuff out there. People can say to me like, when you worked for the Washington Post in 2014, you said this. I'm like, man, that was like a decade ago, but okay. So that's the same problem that J.D. Vance has in some ways. There's just a lot of stuff of him talking, and he is sort of a provocateur, or at least he was sort of a provocateur, you know, a cultural critic. So he was sort of playing that role, um, but that is not the role that you want as a VP. And I think that's why that rollout has been rocky. Well, Chris, we certainly have a lot to look forward to, especially in the next 24 hours. I appreciate you coming on with me, and you are welcome back anytime. Chris Eliza, thank you for joining I'm me. I'm happy to do it. Thank you for having me. Take care.